welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative director is Nancy Cole, and this show investigates the arts and culture all around Tampa Bay. And a very important part of the culture of Tampa Bay, in fact, of, of Florida itself, is the uh, presence and work of many talented authors. And we have an attorney turned writer finishing his fourth novel, which will be out in October of 2013. I first met him when he had his first novel uh, presented. It was called The Mayor of Lexington Avenue. It's a very absorbing uh, mystery, and uh, we have the chance to talk to him about it. And maybe ask why attorneys write mysteries. Well, we're all looking to get out of the practice of law, so we, <laughs> we, you know, this is one of the things that we think that we can do because we spend so much time in our lives writing briefs and complaints and right. other things. So we uh, automatically think that we can be writers. Uh, well, you're a trial attorney, or you, you practice yes, as a trial attorney. Uh, did you, how many trials do you think you've uh, performed uh, in? Well, I don't know if I got to 100, but... Well, that's a lot. Somewhere <laughs> between 50 and 100, oh. I'd say. Well, when you were growing up, and it wasn't in Florida, uh, did you have any idea that this uh, career would take you, or did, would you fix on the career at that point? And did you think it would take you into the field of writing? I grew up in New York. My uncle was a lawyer, so my mother used to always tell me, Jimmy, you know, she'd always say to other people, Jimmy's going to be a lawyer like his uncle. So uh, for a long time, I assumed that I was supposed to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then later on, when I thought I had the opportunity to make up my own mind, I thought, well, maybe this is something that, uh, that um, I'd be good at. Mm -hmm. And so that's how, I, that's how I decided to become a lawyer. I don't... I don't know if it was, uh, you know, the something that w I think I was fairly good at it, but I don't know if it was my passion. You know, I think writing books is my passion. Now I, now I'm a professor. I teach, and I, you know, and I just love that. I, it's hard to find what your passion is. Well, it is. That's that's very true, and and you're very fortunate that you you decided to give it a go um, because it worked, uh, obviously, <laughs> uh, but. Tell us about how your career um, un unrolled and what took you to Florida and what takes you to the law center and so forth. Well, I came to Florida to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was already married. I had two kids. So I, um, I decided that I needed to find a profession, uh, you know, to raise my family. So I... I came here to go to law school, and, and of course, after you live here for about three years, you don't really want to go back up north. That's true. <laughs> so we stayed. <laughs> and um, right. my first job was here at the city of Tampa. No kidding. As a yeah. city attorney? As a city attorney. Ah. And uh, that's where basically I started. I did a lot of, uh, of litigation representing the city for the first four or five years of my career. You know, that's very interesting because I often wondered what kind of matters come before the city attorneys. Everything. Really? You've got all the administrative uh, advice that you have to give to departments. Um, you know, the city's involved in tax litigation, condemnation. You know, personally, I was involved in representing uh, the police department. Police officers get sued all the time. There are claims against the city, people falling, you know, over a crack in the street, or some, something of that nature. There's car accidents involving, you know, the fire department, the, the police department. So there's, there's tons of litigation. Is it only me? But I, I thought to myself, if someone tripped over a crack in the sidewalk and sustained uh, not a, a huge industry, uh, in injury, but enough to go to a doctor, uh, it costs a lot of money to sue. How, yeah. So how does that work? <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's certain provisions that kind of hinder you along the way if you're suing the city. Mm -hmm. Number one, the city has had to be, have to have been put on notice of the, of the problem mm -hmm. and had an opportunity to do something about it and didn't do it. 
the other thing is, is under uh, Florida law, the, you have to make a claim yeah. against the city, and the city has to have a certain period of time to uh, investigate and see if they can resolve the claim before you can file suit. Ah, so which this is a very this, good thing. Yeah, it, it it probably is that, and that's the sort of negotiation time. If you see yes. if this is a really a serious, legitimate thing or or not. Okay, I, that I, that that's a good. I, I have a very good idea of what that's like. There are a lot of little ones, and then every so often a really big one. I haven't been a city attorney for 30 years, so. <laughs> I bet it hasn't changed. <laughs> Probably not. At any rate, then you went from there to trial work? Yeah, I started my own practice, work? I think, in uh, 1984. Uh -huh. And uh, I did uh, mostly a workers' compensation litigation. I did. Uh, personal injury litigation, and I represented uh, uh, employees. Mm -hmm. Employees had been fired. I did uh, uh, discrimination cases, things of that nature. And then, when did the writing hit? I started writing about, I'd say, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of uh, as a hobby, just to um, deal with, you know, the stress of, of of life, mm -hmm. and I, I found that I, I really enjoyed it. And I was I was very lucky because um, my sister is in the business, ah. and she is uh, an editor, mm -hmm. and at the time she was an editor at Random House, so I would send her stuff. Yeah, yeah. she would read it, mm -hmm. and she'd uh, call me and say, "Don't send me this garbage." <laughs> or something of that nature. Um, but I kept writing and I okay. kept sending it to her and she kept reading it and she kept um, kind of editing it, mm -hmm. telling me what to do and how to do it and and really bringing me along. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny because uh, she's as much responsible for me uh, being a published author right. as I am. Is she the, the editor that you pay tribute to in the fir in the in the last page of the Mayor yes. of Lexington Avenue? Yes. Well, that I was I was interested in that too because many writers say that uh, they are very dependent on their editors, or and or uh, um, a listening group who will have your best interests in mind, but will be candid with you and give you, as a writer, the sense of whether work is going well or they don't believe something and so forth. How, um, how tactful do you just, was she in that? She's my sister, <laughs> so she's not very tactful. Not too tactful. <laughs> and, and, you know, you have to have somebody mm -hmm. who can be brutally honest with you. And, you know, I trust my sister explicitly and implicitly because, as I said, um, I'm not just a, an author who relies on his editor. I mean, my sister has basically brought me along. So uh -huh. I rely on her. Uh, you know, we have our arguments and our differences, mm -hmm. sure. but I relied on, rely on her um, more than most. Mm -hmm. And I do have a group of people that Read, read my books and yeah. give me feedback. Right. And, and, and tell you what, if there's a detail that maybe isn't quite the way it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there is a husband and wife, by the way. Um, she was uh, uh, worked for a publisher in New York. He was uh, uh, actually, he sold textbooks and decided he would retire to Sarasota. They married and they have a three story home. She's on the top, he writes, and he has to mail it, email it up to her, <laughs> because if they get to talking about it, it becomes something else, and, yeah. I, and I thought that was very interesting. But it apparently works very well. <laughs> and, and I would imagine, what is the most difficult thing, do you think, that a new writer um, faces? I mean, as an attorney, you probably can be depended on to, to have the details of a trial it, it, that are right. They're right, and if the choosing of a jury or whatever, you you won't. It's not about there. that, though. It isn't. It, it's not. No. Um, a, a good story has to uh, be about people, mm -hmm. and it has to be about people's lives, 
and the reader has to care about the characters uh, more than anything. It's not just, I'm a lawyer, I know my way around a courtroom, therefore I can write. Mm -hmm. it just, it's not about that. Right. It's, about, it's about creating characters who, uh, who um, a reader uh, sees them as flesh and blood people who you're pulling for them, you want them to succeed, you want them to overcome whatever difficulties they have, mm -hmm. and, and that's what makes, uh, it makes a good movie, it makes a good book, it makes a good story. Well, was there ever a Mikey for you? Yeah, as Is a matter of right? fact. Um, well, we're talking now about uh, the mayor of uh, right. Lexington Avenue, back in uh, the day. Mikey was the mayor of Lexington Avenue, although he gave it to his friend Johnny, he gave the moniker to, to Johnny. Mm -hmm. But I based Mikey on my brother Mike and my best friend, uh, Anthony Dennehy, who just died this year, and I, I dedicated the, my my book this year to um, to my uh, mother's twin sister, uh. my aunt, and to my uh, best friend Anthony. But I actually based Mikey on uh, on a combination of my brother and, and Anthony Dennehy. In the mayor of Lexington Avenue, he prevails on you to save his son, Rudy. Yeah, and that, and of course, this all takes place in a very small Bass Creek, which is a very small s southern Florida town. I I'm just trying to place it. It was like, I'm not sure where it is. I'm not sure where it is exactly, but it, I get the feeling it's somewhere in the middle and down a little. Yeah, it's over down in, in the middle of the state, in yeah. the southern part of the state right. near Lake Okeechobee. Ah. Yeah, now we and I, I actually based it's a fictional town, but I based it on a real town. You did. And the plot, of course, is this young man who is, um, uh, he, he's not uh, retarded at all. He's simply a little slow. Uh, is the, really the, um, the pick of two uh, policemen, actually one who does most of the lead work, and, an, and a district attorney. Uh, for a quick way to settle this case, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then you arrive, or the the hero arrives, uh, who's going to pay the uh, pay back the uh, all the fun they had <laughs> as kids. Well, he's already in death row when when Jack Tolan yeah. uh, uh, represents him. Right. Now the reason I made Rudy, he's not what we would call legally retarded. No. Uh, but he's slow, mm. is if you're legally retarded, they won't put you to death. Uh, but if you're not legally retarded, you can be uh, executed. Okay. And the difference it's all the difference. can be a number it's huge. <laughs> could be two points on your IQ. Yeah. Oh, wow. My. I mean, there's other that's factors amazing. that, that yeah. they can take into to account, but that's... That's Florida. That was one of the thoughts that I had in creating uh -huh. um, Rudy because he, um, he obviously was a slow kid and he was his own worst enemy because he was so affable and yes. he, was, he was going to talk He's, to somebody yes. no matter what. Right, and he trusted people implicitly. Yes. And he had a very nice mother, <laughs> and yes. that was important too, which is, which is one of the elements I see sort of wrapped around a lot of uh, the book. That that uh, that kind of closeness of family. Uh, how about the next books? Tell me whether you chose a particular legal um, problem or situation, w which was maybe reflective of the state, or maybe is is common to many states. Um, and, and did you make them different for different reasons? Yeah. Um, What's your next one? The second one was. Uh, the second one was called the Law of Second Chances. That's a great name. And. Um, both my books had a, a, a Florida story. My, fir my first two books had a Florida story and a New York story. And then they kind of came together in the middle. And uh, The Law of Second Chances, what I wanted to do different in that book was I wanted to write about a fictional character, but I wanted, I wanted to base it on a, a real story. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people would come up to me after I did the mayor and they'd say, was that a true story? Mm -hmm. And I'd say no, and I'd see they were kind of disappointed, like, almost disappointed yes. because they were, it was so real to them. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe 
it would be better if I, I based on a real story so that people could see that I'm just not making stuff up, mm -hmm. that this st kind of stuff really happens. Sure. That people get uh, on, on death row through all kinds of machinations, mm -hmm. you know, involving the police, the prosecutor, because everybody, you, it's, 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 it's human nature. Everybody has their own agenda. And sometimes, uh, you know, other people are the victim of it. So sure. that was the, 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 the big thing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the, the character in, in The Law of Second Chances was a fellow named Henry Wilson, who was a, a, like a six foot five black man who, um, you know, was kind of a career criminal. Mm -hmm. But uh, the question was whether he was guilty or innocent of the murder that he was on death row for. And then there was another story about um, uh, a young man from New York who uh, was kind of a, a, a real loser. <laughs> and and um, so those two stories kind of combined okay. in, the, in the Law of Second Chances. Have, but it's really about the characters. Is it, have you been tempted or have you uh, dealt with uh, Stand Your Ground? I haven't yet. Yeah. It's really uh, it's something that is growing by itself. Yes. Uh, particularly when it's used as an excuse, whether it's one shot or maybe forty, <laughs> you know, and that right. has happened. That right. Happened. It's a big, big, big problem. It is, and I'm surprised that it has lasted as long as it has, um, and been uh, really intentionally uh, left as aside by uh, the legislature. Uh, it's it's making trouble wherever it is used, and it's being used more and more. But that would probably be a pretty interesting yeah, situation. Yeah, a very very uh, good idea for a plot. Yeah. What, what is uh, what's your third one now? The third one is is going to be out in like a matter of days. The third one is called the lawyer's lawyer. What I wanted to do in that uh, book, it's all of the uh, books. My main character is a lawyer named Jack Tobin. Jack's He's a flawed guy, but he's a, you know, he has a, he has a good moral code. Uh, and Jack was a very successful uh, civil trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. And he kind of retired to um, Bass Creek. And, and, and he first uh, represented uh, Rudy, who was mm -hmm. his, his, his best friend's son. And then he felt this was his calling to... Um, uh, represent people on death row. So he was doing it for free. Um, and he was working for a group called Exoneration. And in, in Law of Second Chances, he represented Henry Wilson. And then in this book, um, he's asked to... It, this book starts off uh, in northwest Florida with a serial killer. Uh, there killing, have been a number of them from northwest Florida. Right. And that's, uh, you know, kind of a very similar... Yeah setting, he's killing um, co-eds. Uh, and so initially, it's, a, it's about the investigation, but it's, it's not a big part of the book. Uh, the, the big part of the book is when Jack becomes involved, and, and the issue for him, number one, is do I want to represent a serial killer? Because um, he always represents people that he believes are innocent. Mm -hmm. But he could be wrong. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you represent a serial killer and you made a mistake? Yeah. What, how do you live with that? What are the ramifications of that? Uh, so that's the subject of um, the main <laughs> plot, so mm -hmm. to speak, of uh, the lawyer's lawyer and, uh, and how that works out. Right. So these are moral dilemmas as well. For Absolutely. The, for, for the, Every uh, story is a moral dilemma in some way. <laughs> right. Well, so, so for some, they, didn't, they don't have moral dilemmas. They just do what they do. That's all. Um, uh, do you intentionally um, develop a, a dilemma, a, a, a morality issue, let's say, if that goes along with all the, all the proceedings that uh, a trial would and maybe some setbacks or some new evidence, whatever 
provides. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, do, do you have a response from readers to the morality issues, or is it usually simply to the action? <laughs> uh, no, it's not just to the action. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I do have a response. As a matter of fact, I would say the response uh, by readers is always to the characters and always to, um, uh, you know, the, the people. And, uh, you know, sometimes in my books, people die. Ah, right. And, um, you know, people write me about that and how they, how they were affected by it mm -hmm. and how they were, sometimes how they were moved by it. Right. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the action. No, well, it has to do with the writing and how it hits them. Right now, uh, and I, this is just a little digression, right now everyone in America is, is so engaged with what has happened in Newtown, Connecticut, mm -hmm. uh, and someone recently said, in another two months, uh, Americans have, uh, can forget very easily, they may, may, there may be nothing done about it. Uh, What's your feeling about that? Do you think Americans sort of forget easily? I have a lot of feelings about that. I think that we do. I, I think it's just the nature of, um, you know, television. Yeah. Everything is always, um, uh, there's always got to be a new story at the end of the day. There's, there's always something to keep people's interest. So we almost have a, a national attention deficit disorder. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, it's yeah, just the way it is. That's well put. <laughs> uh, this, this has been a cumulative thing now, and this yes. is the most devastating one. Yes. And um, so little. I don't believe that people are going to let this go. At least I hope not. I hope not either. I hope that people stay on this uh -huh. and make sure that something is done so that it doesn't happen again. There were very various ways to look at it, too, and I have seen that a couple of talk shows in, on radio uh, have uh, directed it as at the amount of uh, attention being given to mental illness. Another one is for the assault rifles and, and the killing machines, the portable killing machines. Mm -hmm. So there are many things to consider. Um, it is I, a complex issue. It is complex. It's not at all simple. Uh, um, and I and I I'd like to take you from there to what you do as Let a professor. Let me just say this. Well, if I'm, I'm talking sure, about sure. it, just say this: if people think that guns aren't a part of it, that's just insane. Oh, yes, it's that's just right. insane. No, nobody can. We've got kill we've got to stop people. this assault weapon mm -hmm. uh, stuff. It's just crazy. Yeah, I agreed. Agreed. Um, you teach at um, Stetson School. You yes. both both. Uh, the new uh, the uh, Tampa and uh, St. Petersburg. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And yes, I uh, I'm a professor of law now. Mm. Nice nice title. Um, <laughs> I teach skills courses. I teach uh, uh, students how to um, try cases, mm -hmm. how to take cases from the time that they meet the client to um, uh, the time that the case goes to uh, trial. Mm -hmm. And I also teach them how mediation negotiation, which is such a, a big part of trial practice uh, right now. Yeah. And I'm also the director of the Tampa Law Center. And what is that, the Tampa Law Well, the Tampa Law Center, Center uh, was started about eight years ago. Uh, it's up on Tampa Street. And we um, uh, basically, we uh, have the, the Law Center for um, our part-time program, students who want to be uh, attorneys um, but also have to work for a living. Mm -hmm. So it's um, much more active at night than it is during oh, the day. Oh, I imagine. Do you have many policemen? Uh, I can't answer that question, but we do have, we do yes. have uh, some. Okay. Yes. Uh, my my son-in-law is a, a professor at uh, John Jay University in New York. In New York, yeah. And that began as a... Uh, uh, actually a way to further acquaint New York's uh, police with the laws and, and their part in it. And, and it, I think it also devolves for, for many of them as something they'd really seriously like to practice themselves. So I, want, I, I wondered whether the Tampa Law Center is experiencing that. Yeah, there are police officers there. There definitely are. I, don't yeah. just, I just don't know how many uh, -huh. uh and what percentage of the student population there are 
Uh, do you use this, by the way? Have you used the, um, the situation of professor and students in any of your books? Yet? No, you not haven't. yet. <laughs> what is the fourth one, then? Uh, the fourth one's called The uh, Alligator Man. Oh, that was it'll interesting. Be, what does that mean? <laughs> it'll be out in, in October. And it is, um, the book starts off with a, um, uh, uh, a man is walking on a, a road down in the, uh, uh, way down in South Florida near the Everglades. Oh, oh. And on both sides of the road is swamp. Mm -hmm. And you can actually hear um, the uh, alligators. And, uh, and they are very fearsome. I, I once heard an alligator at night. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a rifle shot, but louder. <laughs> oftentimes down there, they actually just go across the road. Oh. So he, as he's walking, you know, you're thinking with him, and he's thinking about um, how close he is to death. Mm -hmm. And then um, as he, he turns around, he's walking back, and a car comes out of nowhere and just knocks him right into the swamp. Oh. Oh. -hoo. And then... He's gone. That's it. And then you find out that he was actually um, a um, CEO of an energy company that um, uh, was a very, very successful company. And then it went out of business. And the year before it went out of business, he checked out with about a $100 million golden parachute. And when the company finally went down, uh, all the employees lost everything. They lost their health insurance, they lost all their pension benefits, and they, and they lost their jobs. So um, one of those employees is charged with the murder uh, uh, of this individual. I'm, as unbelievable as it sounds, we have covered a whole half hour of talking about writing. Really? Yes. And um, I'll save my question about self-publishing, because you don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, but I've heard that it's raising some interesting things. It, one self-publisher was reviewed by uh, the New York Times, and when they called to ask for a photo, the, the person was just so astonished and very pleased. But it was very pleased. I'm very pleased to have you, and much success. And I hope oh, thank you every much. the thank third you and the here. fourth, and, and with the law school, too. Thank you. And thank you for being with us and plan to join us again.